Welcome back to the second part of our session over lunch today. So we had before lunch a paper about what happens to the macroeconomy when policy rules change, monetary policy rules, for example, and how we can think about it in terms of counterfactuals and how the economy devolves. And now we will address another aspect of change and uncertainty, which is the, uh, the question of how consumers react to uh, increases in un uncertain environment. As you can imagine, in the context in which we are at present here in Europe, but not only in Europe, this is an absolutely central question, not only for science, but also for policy, uh, with the events that we all observe, uh, observe around us. The only issue is that, um, uh, so shortly after lunch, I believe, it's not our primary problem, but okay, let's look beyond lunch. So um, I'm joined on the podium by Dimitri Georgarakas from the ECB and Jean Jeanne Kumo from Sciences Po in Paris. And uh, I would, without much further ado, give the floor to you, Dimitri. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, and many thanks to the organizers for uh, including uh, the paper. I'm going to talk about the effects of macroeconomic uncertainty on household spending. This joint work with Oli Koibion, Yuri Goronichenko, my uh, ECB colleague, uh, Jeff Kenny, and uh, Michael Weber. And of course, the usual disclaimer uh, applies. So the idea that high uncertainty uh, induces households to spend less and firms to reduce their investment and employment is a quite intuitive one and is generally present in policy discussions, especially uh, during uh, crisis times. Uh, as for example, you can see this uh, quote here from Christina Romer that dates back uh, to the Great uh, uh, Recession in the US, where she recognized, of course, the very high prevailing volatility at the time. And uh, as she stressed, the resulting uncertainty has almost surely contributed to a decline uh, in household spending. Uh, in his review of the literature, uh, Nick Bloom has emphasized that the empirical evidence on economic agents' behavior is at best suggestive, and as Nick uh, highlights, uh, more empirical work on the effects of uncertainty would be valuable, particularly work which can identify uh, clear causal uh, relationships. So in case you wonder uh, why uh, it is so challenging to establish uh, a, a clear causal uh, link that runs from uh, uncertainty to uh, economic agents' uh, behavior, uh, for this there are at least three, three factors. Uh, first, uh, there are confounding aggregate factors uh, like pandemics, revolutions, uh, natural disasters, that are typically present uh, during periods of elevated uncertainty. This makes hard uh, to identify and uh, isolate uh, the effect uh, of interest. Uh, if you look at a more micro level, there are correlations with time varying uh, household unobservables. You could think, for example, uh, like time varying optimism or uh, agents' outlook uh, about the economic uh, prospects which makes, again, very hard to identify uh, credibly the causal effect of interest, uh, even if you use panel fixed effects uh, model, models. And uh, in addition, separately identifying the effects of expectations about first and second moments uh, is, again, tricky because generally uh, large uncertainty events are also associated with significant deteriorations in the expected um, economic outlook. So against uh, this background, uh, the present paper uh, designs and implements uh, a randomized control trial using a new uh, euro area household uh, survey. So via this uh, experimental approach, uh, we induce exogenous variation to household expectations, thus their first moment and uncertainty, their second moment, about future economic growth uh, in the euro area. And utilizing this exogenous variation, we can estimate the causal effect of uncertainty, that is the second moment, net of first uh, moment's uh, expectations on households spending on both, as you will see, non-durables and durable goods, and this is the main focus of interest for the paper, but also we take a look on how uncertainty 
can affect households' propensity to assume a higher financial risk. Given that we use micro-level data, we are able to also estimate uh, the so-called heterogeneous treatment effects. That means we can uh, estimate the effects of uncertainty into subgroups uh, of households that are of interest. Let me give you a quick preview of our findings. Basically, uh, we find that uncertainty uh, reduces net of first moment expectations, the spending of households on uh, non-durable and uh, some larger uh, ticket uh, uh, items. Uh, that higher uh, macro uncertainty also reduce uh, households' propensity to assume financial risk, especially by uh, choosing to, to be less exposed to mutual funds. Uh, and in addition, we have to say something about uh, the possible channels at work. So one obvious channel via which uh, uncertainty about the macroeconomy can transmit it on household behavior is via uncertainty about own income expectations. Uh, we saw that this is one channel at work, but it's, it is not the only one. So there are also other channels at work that we cannot tell apart each of them, but uh, we uh, consider them so uh, together. So, for example, expectations about taxes, uh, real and financial asset prices, or even more generally, uh, households use about uh, the government uh, quality. And as regards heterogeneity, we also identify some heterogeneous treatment effects. We see that consumption tends to be more responsive uh, in, in response to macroeconomic uncertainty, especially among households working in riskier sectors and also households that uh, have included in their portfolios uh, risky financial assets as they are more exposed to stock market uh, risk. So the data we use come from the new ECB's consumer uh, expectation survey. This is an internet panel that started uh, in its pilot phase in January 2020. Uh, run initially across the six largest euro area countries. Uh, since January 21, uh, the survey has been expanded in five more euro area countries, covering basically every month a very large sample of uh, 19,000 uh, households. Uh, the sample is a mixed uh, probabilistic sample uh, where respondents are recruited uh, via random dialing and non-probabilistic uh, segment that basically uh, recruitment takes place by existing online uh, panels. And sample weight serves there to make uh, the samples uh, representative of the underlying uh, national uh, populations. As the name suggests of the survey, we interview House about various expectations, not only inflation, but also their expectations and perceptions about other macro uh, and idiosyncratic uh, variables. And importantly, we also ask houses about their behavior. Every quarter, we collect data on their consumption on a number of non-durable items uh, that they bought over the past uh, one month. Uh, and the, the survey features uh, a mixed frequency uh, modular approach where we ask questions at different frequencies uh, to the houses. Of course, a nice feature is its panel dimension where you can link respondents uh, across um, time. Back in September 2020, we fielded uh, a 10-minute special purpose survey following the regular uh, monthly wave. Uh, and as you will see, also we utilize data from uh, other waves close to September 2020. But in this special purpose survey, we are able to field our uh, randomized control uh, trial. Uh, and in subsequent waves, we can measure also household behaviors. And as I said, we can link this via the panel structure of the survey. In case you are interested in finding more, uh, perhaps you can take a look at this reference. Also recently, we have developed a nice web page where we provide a lot of information. We update every month the information about the survey. So let me walk you through the steps we take in order to field uh, this randomized control trial. First, we take the entire sample and we ask respondents uh, questions in order to elicit their first and second uh, expectations uh, about uh, GDP growth uh, in the euro area. Uh, subsequently, we randomly split the sample into uh, subsamples. Uh, one set of groups, the so-called information treatments, they receive information that I will show you in a second uh, about uh, actual numbers referring to the GDP 
uh, growth, um, while there is also a control group that you can think of this uh, is akin to these uh, placebo groups uh, in medical trials that receives no information. After this information provision uh, stage, we get back again to households and we elicit once more their first and second moment expectations as regards euro area GDP growth. And we see whether the information treatments we, we provided them with uh, make a difference or so move their, their posteriors, basically. And via the panel structure of the survey, in subsequent waves, we can also track uh, uh, and assess whether there are deviations between the treatment and control group in the actual uh, consumption uh, behavior. So now let me go uh, across these steps uh, one by one. So uh, initially, we ask uh, a relatively simple question to households in order to elicit their first and second moment uh, expectations. So uh, we ask them to give their best guess about the lowest growth rate, that is your prediction for the most pessimistic scenario for the euro area growth rate over the next 12 months, and the highest uh, growth rate that uh, people expect, that is their most optimistic prediction. Just based on these two numbers they report, uh, you can assume a symmetric triangular distribution that basically attaches progressively lower weight to this reported uh, extrema, but importantly allow to uh, deduce first and second moments with respect to these expectations uh, on, uh, for each uh, household. Uh, in addition, we ask uh, another question that allowed to fit um, a more kind of realistic, if you like, uh, split triangular distribution about the probabilities for, for each of these two uh, of uh, the, these scenarios. So basically, if you see these are statistics um, from using the raw data out of these answers, as I said, what is important is that for each single household, we, can, we are able to estimate both their first and second moments as regards uh, euro area GDP growth. On the left-hand side, you see the distribution of answers by countries and uh, from the overall sample with the black line uh, that are symmetric around 3-4%. Uh, uh, and um, on the right-hand side, you can see their uncertainty uh, that is uh, more skewed. So you see there are people that some people that uh, perceive high levels of uncertainty as regards euro area GDP growth. As I said, an advantage uh, of this design is that you have for each single household both moments, so you can graph the one versus the other from the raw data. So this is a scatter plot uh, graphing this association that shows this U shape that basically suggests that uh, among those who either expect uh, very high growth or they are very pessimistic about uh, growth prospects, uh, these two groups also hold higher levels of uh, uncertainty. So following this uh, pre-treatment stage where we elicited households priors, we randomly split the sample and we go to uh, each treatment group and we provide the following piece of info. So the first treatment group receives this information so that the average prediction among professional forecasters is that the euro area economy will grow at a rate of 5.6% in 2021. And the qualitative statement in support of this that says that by historical standards, this is a strong growth. Instead, the second treatment group receives the following issue, the, the following information that is professional forecasters are uncertain about economic growth in the euro area in 2021 with the difference between the most optimistic and the most pessimistic predictions being 4.8 percentage points. Again, that by historical standards, this is a big difference. So clearly this aims to move more the second than the first expectation, uh, moments in expectations, and a third treatment group uh, receives information on both. We have a, we experimented with a fourth treatment group receiving information uh, about uh, uh, disagreement professor forecast about forecast about own countries uh, growth, but this didn't prove to be uh, very uh, influential, so we don't use it in, in the analysis. So following this information provision stage, we need to go back to households and ask them again, elicit again, first and second moment uh, expectations. But generally, when you design surveys, it is prescribed to avoid 
using uh, exactly the same wording when you ask a, a specific con uh, concept uh, to, to respondents, because otherwise you typically annoy them a lot. So what we did is, again, we elicit first and second moments, but here using a different question that has been used uh, in the literature, uh, where people have to assign probabilities over three scenarios for the prospects of euro area uh, GDP growth. Um, so basically, the differences in design between the pretreatment and this question uh, will be uh, absorbed by uh, the control group. So do people update their first and second moment expectations after receiving information? The answer first is yes. Uh, on, uh, on the left uh, panel, you see how they update their uh, average expectations uh, after receiving uh, the treatment. So, the treatment, so basically comparing priors with posteriors, you see that particularly those groups that receive information about uh, the point forecast, they update towards the signal they receive. So those who hold very high expectations, priors initially, they reduce their priors about uh, growth, while those with very low ones, they, uh, they increase them. Uh, as regards uncertainty, because there was high uh, initial uncertainty in the sample, uh, our, uh, our treatments uh, for most households reduce the perceived uncertainty. But what is really important here is that our different treatments induce different relative changes in the first and second moments. This gives us enough power in order to identify the effect of interest in the same regression, so to identify separately the effects of second moments net of the first moments. And as I said, in follow-up months, we are able to measure behavior. So for example, in October, people report with respect to these uh, bundles of goods, uh, how much, whether and how much uh, they bought over the previous month. And this nicely aligns with the time uh, uh, they basically received uh, information uh, just in the previous month. And also we have information back then only on the extensive margin of whether people purchased um, some bigger ticket items, more durable items like car, durable holiday and luxury goods. So this is the, the main uh, equation we estimate. So basically, if you think of non-durables, this is a reduced form uh, consumption regression where we uh, regress log spending on the two endogenous uh, variables of interest, so the first uh, and the second moment about your area GDP growth, plus some controls to reduce the noise. Uh, of course, these uh, two variables are endogenous, and we use our instruments uh, to, to instrument for each of them. So via IV, uh, we can credibly estimate the, the effect of both, of each of them uh, on, uh, on consumption. So these are the results from uh, the baseline uh, uh, regression. Uh, basically, uh, you see at the first row uh, and the first column uh, refers to consumption adjustments just to one month following our formation treatment, so what people report in October. And in the second column, uh, four months after, after fielding uh, the information experiment, which is what people uh, report in January 2021. Uh, and you see what uh, really matters is uncertainty, so, and the underlying effects are relatively large. So this tells you that uh, one percentage point increase in the measure of uncertainty that is roughly about uh, one standard deviation of the cross-sectional distribution post-treatment uh, reduces by 3.43% uh, the spending on non-durable just uh, in one month later on. And the effect uh, seems to be pretty persistent, although a bit less precisely estimated, uh, four months uh, later. And you can see from the F statistics at the bottom, both for the first and second stage, that the instruments were successful in giving us enough power for micro data to identify separately uh, the effect uh, of interest. Uh, we have a number of robustness checks in a, in a recently revised version uh, of the paper. Uh, you can see here some panels with additional set of results. For example, if you use pre-treatment, this uh, more realistic uh, distribution to measure the two moments, uh, the effects are, if anything, even stronger. Uh, 
if we use as a first stage log of uncertainty instead of levels, uh, the, the effects again are uh, similar, also quantitatively similar. Uh, and uh, another consideration is to control for skewness because uh, by eliciting this individual specific distribution, in principle, you can also have a third moment. So you can, uh, you can calculate a measure of skewness. We do so post-treatment. So we control for this measure of skewness. Uh, by construction, this is endogenous. Uh, we don't have enough instruments to, to, to have three endogenous variables estimated simultaneously in the same regression, but still, uh, our IV approach goes through and clearly suggests that if you include skewness, um, the results um, are, um, are broadly the same. Uh, basically, another thing we are doing for consumption is we look at budget share, so whether people, uh, in response to uh, this um, uh, exogenous change in their perceived uncertainty, they adjust more certain uh, goods uh, than the others, Generally, the adjustment seems to be broad-based uh, across uh, most categories. We find there are some small differences for categories that are more discretionary in nature, like, say, uh, recreational activities. But uh, this broad-based re result suggests that uh, the primary reason for this adjustment is, seems to be precautionary saving. Now, we'd like also to, to, to say something more about the underlying channel. So how macro uncertainty uh, by which channels transmits to, uh, to households affects their perceptions and then in turn affects their behavior. So one obvious channel by which this can operate is about households' own income uh, uncertainty. Unfortunately, in the survey uh, every month, uh, we measure both first and second moments uh, about households' um, uh, perceptions about their future uh, income. But other channels could be like uh, expectations about future interest rates or taxes or even more broadly government quality or expectations about um, real and financial uh, asset prices. Uh, we cannot tell apart each of them. Uh, what we can do is we can quantify the importance of uh, personal income growth, uh, we do some robustness there that I don't have the time to explain in detail, but the, the main finding is that the effects do not operate solely by expectations of own income uh, growth. So income growth and uncertainty about own income growth is indeed a channel via which uh, macro uncertainty can transmit to household spending, but it's not the only channel. So uh, then we conjecture that a number of uh, other possible channels that I, I list above are also likely uh, at work. Another thing we are doing again in, in examining the effects of uncertainty on uh, household consumption is to look at the extensive margin, so whether households bought or not, uh, major uh, major uh, items, larger ticket items that are of more durable uh, nature. And every month in the survey, we ask indeed whether people bought over the previous month uh, a house, durables, uh, cars, uh, holiday pack packages or luxury uh, goods. Uh, we also know uh, from the data their plans of households to buy goods over the next 12 months. So conditioning for this, the effect we estimate is more like uh, a surprise effect of uh, the uh, exogenously moved uh, macro uncertainty on, on spending. And we find, especially with uh, regards to the last two uh, categories, so holiday packages and luxury goods, some uh, economically sizable, uh, statistically significant uh, negative effects of uh, higher perceived um, uncertainty. Um, uh, these effects were just estimated next month, so the effects tend to fade four months after the treatment. So for the durable goods, this might be more consistent with some models that have this, uh, way, emphasize this wait and see uh, channel. Uh, the second margin, although it's not the main focus of the paper that we look at, uh, regards post-treatment behavior in financial investing. And as we know, households are typically quite inert, so they very 
um, slugies, uh, and uh, the, generally they don't reshuffle the, their portfolios, so they tend to stay with the same uh, uh, mixture of assets over very long periods in time. So it would have been uh, challenging to, to identify this through the, the data, even if we had to use uh, many panel uh, follow-up waves. Uh, so what we did instead was to ask houses after receiving the formation treatments uh, to think that they have received a windfall of 10K euro. Uh, in this case, how they would invest uh, in uh, several financial asset categories. So we asked them to allocate across this 10K across the, uh, these categories that you see uh, on the slide. And there we can see whether they uh, indeed uh, are willing to assume more financial risk after receiving uh, this information treatment. And these are the budget shares that would allocate out of this 10K windfall uh, on uh, different assets, con conditioning on their actual share of investments that we had already asked uh, one month before fielding our information treatment that was basically in August 2020. And you see that uh, we find sizable effects, especially uh, as regards uh, the effect of uncertainty or reducing exposure in uh, mutual funds, which is a kind of um, standard way where via which households um, hold uh, stocks, an indirect way uh, holding stocks. And the last piece of evidence regards uh, the heterogeneity uh, that I uh, would like to to look at more closely across various groups of uh, interest. So one first split we try is we, uh, we split house ac across those working in high risk sectors, so sectors that were affected by the pandemic, low risk sectors that were less affected and retired that are typically uh, worry less about uh, their uh, future streams of income. Uh, and when we do this, uh, you see uh, results in the first three columns. We see that the effect of uncertainty mainly operates among households that work uh, in risky, uh, in high risk uh, sectors. Uh, another split we are doing is to split houses between those that hold only safe assets in their portfolios and those that include at least some risky financial assets, so they are more exposed to. Uh, stock market risk. Uh, and when we do this, uh, it's the last two columns. You see in column four, those houses that do hold, they do have some exposure to stock market risk. Uh, the effect of uncertainty on reducing spending operates mainly uh, through this, so uh, for, for, for this uh, group of households. So um, let me conclude. Uh, as you saw, we used uh, a randomized control trial, uh, an approach that uh, becomes increasingly popular uh, in microeconomic uh, research using uh, recent advancements in uh, household and firm surveys to address empirical challenges in identifying the causal effect of macro uncertainty on household uh, behavior. We find that elevated macro uncertainty uh, strongly uh, reduces consumer spending, both on non-durables, but also on selected uh, durable goods. And the effect seems also in some specifications to persist um, over time. At the same time, it looks like it reduces households' propensity to invest in risky financial um, assets. And as I said, an advantage of using microdata is that you can really look closer into certain groups of interest. Uh, so we find also some plausible heterogeneous effects by sector of employment and portfolio riskiness. And this is my last slide. In finding with, in finding with the repercussions of the Great uh, Depression, President Roosevelt uh, had famously said that the only thing we have to fear is fear uh, itself. Recessions are characterized by increased macro uncertainty and thus an economic recovery may require, as we uh, partly argue in the paper, management of expectations, assurances by policymakers, pretty much like the assurances that uh, President Roosevelt uh, gave at the time, a provision of stronger safety nets and policies targeting the more vulnerable groups like groups uh, in sectors that uh, have been 
greatly affected uh, during the pandemic, as we showed. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion. Indeed, uh, Jan Como is the discussant, and uh, needless to say, as you realized, uh, Dimitri is a very, very prolific researcher in this field with randomized control trials and the exploitation of these surveys for highly uh, significant policy questions uh, for, for central banks. Uh, really a powerhouse with his co-authors of research in this field, but we will hear more from Jan. Yeah, so thanks a lot uh, for the organizers to ask me to discuss this paper. Um, it's, a, it's a great paper. Um, so the main question, it's a very straightforward paper with one main question that they, throughout the paper they go after. And this main question is how does the uncertainty about future income, in their case future macroeconomic uncertainty, affect people's consumption? So they mainly like frame it in terms of uh, literature about the effect of macro uncertainty and so evolution of uh, maybe saving over time along the business cycle. Uh, I think the results are so, this is such an important question that the author's result could also speak to other literatures and just uh, uh, trying to measure uncertainty at the macro level, but also household finance literatures, precautionary saving, uh, some paper looking about the phenomenon saving on the rainy day. So when it's, the world is uh, very bad, you actually keep saving, why? And one suggestion is exactly this effect of uncertainty because the correlation between the first moment, so average GDP is really low, but also lots of uncertainty, so people do save even though it is a rainy day. Um, and so the results would validate at least uh, qualitatively this, uh, this challenge, which again, we, we lack causal evidence of that in the household finance literature as well. Um, so overall, I think it's a very important question. The paper is really uh, straightforward and make, uh, the point that they're trying to make is very clear. And they've got this um, methodology that is really, we are looking for a causal relationship. So let's do an RCT and let's try to establish this causal relationship. So what they do more precisely is uh, yeah, build this RCT in which they expose some respondents to different pieces of information about professional forecast of growth in the euro area over the next 12 months. And they do that in September 2020. Uh, the uh, information they give is the mean of different professional forecast and the maximum differences between the forecasters. Uh, from this, in the survey, they also elicit people's distribution of growth in the euro area, and they show that this treatment, so giving people information, actually do affect their own uh, perception of the first and second order um, effect on their distribution, individual level distribution of growth in the euro area. So the treatment does work in the sense that it does change people's uh, prediction of uh, growth in the euro area. And so they've got an exogenous variation that they can use to estimate the effect of the first and second order moment of the distribution of expected growth in the euro area on people's spending. What do they find? That a one point decrease in uncertainty um, about growth in the euro area over the next 12 months raises monthly non durable spending by 3% in some other specification. They find up to 5%. Uh, it's more so among people in the sectors that were more exposed to COVID. Um, the uncertainty also affects the composition of spending with some goods um, being more prominent in the consumption basket. And a decrease in uncertainty raises spending on durables and investment in mutual funds and crypto. So it's a pretty consistent story that uh, uh, and that's why I find the, the paper great. Now I'm gonna make a few comments, but these are more just um, things I would like to see maybe discussed a bit more in the paper, but uh, I, I find the, the paper very clear and very in, in, important. So the first thing is what is uncertainty? You've got this number going from zero to, to 15, but so uncertainty is uh, one standard deviation in this uh, individual level distribution of expected growth in the euro area uh, in the next 12 months. And I computed that, for instance, uh, to have an, uh, an uncertainty of one, if, so these distributions are based on uh, people's uh, reporting the lowest and highest forecast of possible growth in the euro area. And uh, if people have sort of symmetric uh, um, 
uh, symmetric distribution, and uncertainty of one would mean a 5% difference between the lowest and the highest. And uncertainty of four would mean a 10% difference between the lowest, the worst case scenario, and the highest possible growth that you expect. So I think maybe giving a bit more um, content to, to this number could be, could be interesting. Um, and then my point is that you know, on this channel, you see that the implied mean actually very, you see very large number here. Uh, so it goes from yeah, minus 20, 20, minus 15, minus 10, and above 15, 20, 10. Um, and so um, one question that I, I want to raise, and you see that uncertainty is really high, um, above 2.5, but uh, uh, for those people with uh, more extreme uh, predictions about the growth rate in the euro area. Um, so would that be possible that people with very large uncertainty actually have no real idea what the growth rate has been, what would be a normal number to give for the growth rate? And so before the prior uncertainty is really um, large because they have a bit no idea what it could be. And then you treat them, so you give them some sort of anchoring or reference point, and then their uncertainty changes because they didn't know before what could be growth in the euro, what would be a normal number for that. Um, this could explain possibly why, you know, there's this treatment you find that when you form people, when the, so the authors find that when they form people, even about the average growth, uh, which would be I think 5.6%, this changes people's prediction about the uncertainty. And this is based from lowest, highest, etc. So probably even by giving them just a number, so an average, nothing about the uncertainty, the disagreement between forecaster is still going to change people's uh, uncertainty, uh, their own forecast. So this could be the case if uh, the mechanism is that you reassure, you sort of give people a, a reference point. Um, it could also explain why you find this strange but small effect that the decrease in the mean expected growth actually comes with an increase in consumption, uh, holding uncertainty uh, constant. And this would be the case if, again, so the main treatment is to sort of reassure people, like things are not going to be crazy. It's probably not going to be minus 20%. It's probably not going to be 30%. So by giving this sort of reassuring message, um, people at the same time raise their consumption and also get towards more normal uh, expectations of growth rate or closer to what the professional forecaster have. Um, the second question is about or comment is about the choice of the instrument. So um, I think the usefulness of the instrument is to remove any, any correlation between uh, consumption and uncertainty that would be coming from characteristics affecting both consumption and uncertainty. So if I write it in this very, very simple way, C here stands for consumption, U for uncertainty. Uh, C would be a linear function of uncertainty plus some demographics, Z, and uncertainty would be like some a uh, random uh, variable here plus the effect of uh, demographics. And you see that if you just regress uh, uncertainty over consumption, you get, they get a bias because you're going to get that, uh, the effect and co just a correlation between people's characteristics. Uh, when you've got an exogenous treatment, the really nice thing is that now you get an exogenous variation treat here. And so if you look at the the effect of this treatment on consumption, if the treatment does affect uncertainty, you're going to uh, correctly capture the alpha without the bias. Now, what I was surprised when I read your paper, but maybe there's a very good way to do that, is that your instrument is not just the treatment, but the treatment interacted with the prior. And my belief is that maybe the prior capture a bit some demographic characteristics. Uh, people with a very high prior may have a different level of education, different jobs than other people. And if that's the case, because you're doing this, uh, this type of instrumentation, maybe you know, so you're, it's coming back by the window, this effect of uh, demographics, and maybe you're capturing, uh, in part, a covariance between the reason why people spend more uh, in September 2022, which is due to the demographics, and the fact that they respond a lot to the treatment, which is due to the demographics. So you do control, when you do this regression, it's not just directly the effect of uncertainty on consumption 
with the treatment, you also control linearly for Z, so this would partly disappear um, unless Z affects consumption non-linearly, non in which case I think the, the bias would uh, come back, like it could, it could be there. And so the, the trying to think about the situation in which this might be a problem is that if people who have high prior uncertainty also have a high spending in September. Because a high prior uncertainty in what, what the artists find uh, associates with uh, also a high effect of the treatment. Like those with a really high prior uncertainty are those who reduced the uncertainty following the treatment. And I was thinking maybe a test for that would be to do a placebo. Uh, look at the effect of, uh, if we see exactly the same procedure, look at spending in August 2020, and if you don't find any effect, it's good, and you're sure that your treatment was what uh, creates the, the response. Um, on that, so uh, it's a bit of a related comment. Um, you find that the positive effect of prior uncertainty on uh, spending. So this is uh, really great, I think, because what the others find is that the exogenous part of uncertainty, the so one that is actually coming from the treatment, does affect spending negatively, while uh, the prior uncertainty affects spending positively. So this validates the choice of an exogenous variation. We do need an exogenous variation, because otherwise you're going to get some, uh, the two go opposite way. So you do need uh, your instrument, so I think you can um, uh, emphasize a bit that maybe more. Um, but also, like this is a bit consistent with this comment, that people who have a high prior uncertainty also save more. Um, the so last comment is that, uh, so about the timing of the take-up, so I tried to educate myself a bit about this survey. And um, what I understood is, so the treatment is added to the, the survey, and apparently, but maybe I'm not um, a Yossi expert here, uh, the people, uh, there's a window that is opened for them to take the survey from the first Thursday of the month until um, some point later on, and then they can take up the survey at any point during this window. And so it might be that in what apparently 70% of the responses are usually com completed within the first 10 days of the data collection period. In September 2020, the window started on September, um, the 3rd of September. This means that 70% of the people were treated between the 13th and the 30th, but also that 30% of the people were treated quite late. So they're looking at the effect of the treatment on the whole spending of September, while half of the 30% of the people were only actually could have changed their spending because of the treatment only after half of the month. So maybe you could use this sort of margin of when people were treated exactly uh, during the month of September to check uh, whether the effect is stronger for those who took the survey early on, which should be the case, because they could adjust the spending even more to their uh, reduced uncertainty. So that's, uh, these are my comments. Thanks a lot for uh, having me discuss the paper. It's a, it's a great paper. Thank you, John. Uh, take following usual practice, you have any answers to, or you want to answer a little bit? Thanks a lot, John. Indeed, a very thoughtful discussion, paying attention to many, many details that, uh, uh, yeah, we need also to, to take uh, uh, probably uh, again a look. Uh, you know, this is a longer project. We have tried uh, several things, several robust checks. So some of the things you have mentioned we have um, tried, but probably forgot to, to include in this uh, version as robustness. Um, one thing I would like to, to be absolutely clear is uh, how do we measure uncertainty? So um, uh, it, it is prescribed also by Chuck Mansky to uh, when you uh, measure in expectation service expectation, not just to ask about only point forecast because people um, have different underlying distributions. So just reporting that I expect inflation to be 2% and you report the same, this can be quite different due to underlying uh, distributions, and, and we need to measure this. And, and these uh, qu uh, questions we, we use are particularly designed for this. So when we measure uncertainty, we indeed apply formula where for each of these type uh, of questions, we uh, calculate an individual specific 
yeah. uh, measure francese, and then we assume not one standard deviation of this, but uh, a unit change of this to, to, to see the effect of interest. So it's not the standard deviation, um, uh, you know, that uh, we vary there. So, the, the, um, so um, as regards, you know, possible outliers, we know there's a lot of noise in this data. Uh, often you need to filter out to have tried also Huber uh, robust regressions that are that's lower weight to, to outliers. Um, so the, the negative effect we find in, in the first baseline regression about the first moment is despite being significant 10%, we also comment on its quantitative importance. It's really trivial, so uh, we think it's more noise. Um, yes, we need to, to, to explain a bit more the IV strategy because indeed we um, we interact with priors, but note that the priors are orthogonal to, to the optimization, so to the experiment. So this is not a priori an issue. Uh, but what you can do uh, in order also to be uh, statistically, say, waterproof, is to, uh, to, to report, and we have done this, and uh, there the evidence is clear, uh, over, over IDs. Uh, so uh, you, you can test for over ID, and you see that we clearly fail to, to reject the null there. Because there you can use the, as instruments only uh, the dummies of the treatments. Which are, of yeah, course, you, you, you uh, uh, of course, you, you trust, uh, but also great um, suggestion about running a kind of backward-looking um, placebo. Actually, we did it because in August we don't collect data on consumption; we collect in July, though, and we did that. Unfortunately, we didn't report, but okay. a great suggestion. Uh, now, for late respondents, yes, uh, we can look a bit more. To make, but generally, late respondents are always late respondents. Uh, also, we do some other filtering. Some people are speeders, so take the survey uh, in a very fast manner. So we also check this. But thank you very much again for, for all these points. Are well taken. Okay, now we open the floor. So if you have any any questions, before I take the first question, I just want to ask I to my colleagues in the back. I have a question on Slido, but it is, is from five to three. So I'm impressions from the last last session. So I won't take it until you tell me that uh, that is actually for this session. It's from last session. Okay, good. So floor's open for uh, questions. If you want to structure your thoughts, I can ask my first own first question. Uh, if you need some time after a heavy lunch. Um, so um, I, I wanted to follow up where uh, Jan actually started a little bit. Maybe for those of us who are not actively researching in this literature, you could juxtapose your result about the size of the effect, the economic significance of the effect with the macro or other literatures that may use different approaches to measuring uncertainty and to identifying the effect on, uh, of uncertainty on consumption. Maybe give, put your number of these three, four percentage points uh, into perspective with that literature. That would be very helpful, I think, for some of us. Yeah, that, that's a very good point, thanks. So uh, generally, you know, for um, uh, those working with micro data, this is a very big effect. Uh, but also if you kind of aggregate it, it's, it's a kind of huge effect because it's, uh, it affects uh, non-durable spending, you know, just uh, the, the one month afterwards. Uh, of course, uh, you know, this effect is conditional on what kind of uh, change you assume in the underlying uncertainty. So this is uh, straightforward to read if you assume one percentage point uh, assumed increase in uncertainty that corresponds to, as I said, roughly one standard deviation of the cross-section distribution post-treatment. But if you go to the raw data uh, and you see actually after receiving our formation treatments how much people on average uh, change their level of uncertainty and you apply this, which is exactly what raw data tell you, you, you find an adjustment in the following month of non-durable spending of the order of about 0.7 to 0.8 percent, which again, because it's monthly, so it's again a very sizable effect. So there seems to be a very sizable effect on, uh, on uh, non-durable spending that it looks also that persists sometime until consumption in December that is reported in January 21. And uh, also in some of the durable goods with the extensive margin, again, by the standards of the literature, these are very sizable effects. In, the, in a recently revised version, we have done also some there um, back to the envelope calculation to contrast versus macro figures. 
this, this comes with many assumptions we have to make, but it's broadly consistent with what you get also from the macro literature. Thank you. Don't be shy. Here we go. Morten. Um, yeah, I have a hard time formulating this question in my head. Um, <laughs> try my best. I'm, th I'm thinking at the point when you ask about actual consumption, the, uh, in, of course, people are also hit by actual shocks in between. So I'm wondering whether the lack of the impact of the mean, that's because that matters less than the actual shock you are hit with. Whereas I'm not hit with an actual shock on uncertainty, so there you may, that may have a bigger impact. Thanks. So, uh, indeed, in between, you can have many shocks that people face, right? And of course, the longer the horizon over which you look at, the more likely this is to happen. But what is really crucial here for the validity of the experiment is the randomization and allocation uh, across control and treatment groups. Because this tells you, this ensures you actually, that the shocks that people will receive, they have equal probability to receive them either being in any of the treatment groups or being in the control group. As a result, whatever deviation, systematic deviation you identify in their behavior, uh, comes from, from basically the information uh, provision that you did in this random way. So the nice feature about this randomized control trial is exactly this. We know and we are aware that in this data there is a lot of also measurement error, right? But also by kind of similar arguments, measurement error can be dealt with uh, via this randomization. Because for example, people who are more prone, this is self-reported spending, right? People who are more prone to misreporting spending, they are equally likely to be present in each of the treatment and the control group. So you always estimate vis a vis the control group. I, okay, so I understand the answer you gave. But if the actual shock, if, if that was big enough, I guess that could wash out the effect on the first moment of the expectation, no? Um, so, if there was, so yeah, if there was in between uh, a very big so uh, might, but you know, back then there was no, I think uh, actually it's an advantage of the paper that, and actually of this data set, that we are able to fill the information experiment and then based on a different survey that's just one month after, people report their spending and this very nicely aligns because they report their spending with respect to the past 30 days, that is exactly, they count these days, started counting from the time they received the information. So they, it's their actual behavior uh, following this. So uh, as far as I recall back in October 2020, there was no kind of major you know, uh, shock of this kind. Alistair? So there's a very large literature that has a lot of trouble finding effects on you know, expectations of any form in response to shocks, obviously using a very different methodology and design to what you're using here. But here you're finding effects not just on you know, expectations, you're finding these effects that filter through to consumption as well. So you, do you, is kind of your, your opinion on this that it's just due to a very different sort of methodology? Or do you think there's something kind of more fundamentally different kind of besides the methodologies with some of these, in, these, these existing studies in the literature? Right, so um, there are indeed you know, a lot of papers and, and both on the macro and micro front. Uh, on the micro front, uh, papers that I'm aware of, uh, they do find uh, effects on say of consumption uncertainty or background income risk on, on spending, and this is also modeled through uh, state-of-the-art uh, life cycle uh, models. Um, in macro, there are also papers, yes, with some conflicting uh, results. The, the, the thing is, that's why we put so prominently there uh, uh, what um, Nick Bloom uh, has you know, summarized out of this literature, that precisely by the nature of this question is extremely tricky and challenging to, to clearly identify and make causal inference. 
both moments in principle are moving. We were lucky that our instrument, that our treatments uh, not only moved uh, people's posteriors, but also to a different extent. So this gave us indeed a space we, we wanted, we needed to, to identify then separately the, the two effects. So it's, it's a completely different approach for sure here, but uh, it shows, I think, also the power of this kind of methods uh, uh, that, you know, now become, they become more popular and we see that by providing information treatments can change indeed people's behavior in many respects. It's not only consumption or macro, there, there are also recent studies that look at uh, information that graduate students receive on their majors and this uh, on the salaries of the possible sector they can work for in the future and this changes their uh, choices over majors so uh, you know you you find in in various fronts and this is consistent also with you know uh, limited prior information and knowledge that people have for many of these uh, issues okay sorry daniel for misspelling your name sorry for before um other questions? If not, I mean, I can uh, take another one from my uh, primitive list of questions. So, but uh, no, I, it's actually the flip side of the previous one. So, uh, one issue of these randomized control trials is that they always take place in a very peculiar and very specific circumstance and a very specific time, which has not the long time dimension. So. What makes you confident what you measure um, in terms of the consumption reaction, the different goods, the composition is not a special COVID effect rather than a general consumption effect where we as economists and, you know, uh, briefing people of policymakers can uh, be confident that they are uh, of a certain general nature. How, how do you go about these issues? Th thanks, Philip. This is actually a question we receive often in, in seminars when we give this, uh, this paper because apparently we uh, fielded the experiment during uh, COVID period, although it was not exactly, you know, at the time of a lockdown or say at uh, well, it was September. The, time when the, the October is when the, the infections went up again it and the January again. was deep right. into it. Right. Right. But, but I mean, there were no local uh, restrictions at place, um, etc. So uh, again, my answer relates a bit to, to my earlier answer to, to Morton that uh, the beauty of this is uh, via randomization, you can make sure that people that are a priori uh, sensitive or affected by COVID, they are equally present in uh, the control and treatment groups. So this somehow uh, ensures uh, you know, that uh, you don't bias uh, your effects this way. Now, exposed, as we did actually, uh, you, you can split the sample and look at people working in uh, sectors that have been affected more from COVID versus uh, those that have been affected uh, less from COVID. But this is, uh, you know, totally legitimate in this context. It's more kind of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. So your baseline effect, you can trust it in terms of this causal uh, estimate uh, you identify, and then you can split the sample in various ways to see uh, uh, this. Uh, another piece of evidence that I didn't have much time to go through, uh, to talk about was these um, consumption budget shares, where basically we saw that uh, the effects of our information treatments were across the board. So it, it was not the case that we saw concentrated effect of um, increasing consumption uncertainty on certain goods uh, that uh, was more difficult, say, to access uh, due to COVID. There was some bigger effect on recreational activities or uh, on goods that are subject, say, to supply constraints. Um, so it was across the board. So this suggests that it was more a kind of precautionary saving response. So people uh, wanted, um, but, but not strictly, say, a COVID, um, a COVID effect. Okay, thank you. We are at the end of our time. Um, obviously, this new survey of the ECB would give gives tremendous scope for future research. So if people are interested in what are the prospects for using this, uh, maybe you talk to Dimitris, uh, what, how this will, will be gone about. And uh, if you have become interested through this little appetizer, uh, that would lead me to close this session now and tell you that we break for 15 minutes and then I'm sure you will be all coming back for a fascinating discussion with Paul Krugman and Larry Summers 
about something they think less often about than US inflation, which is euro area inflation. So I'm very curious what they come up with. Thank you very much.